A very good morning to everybody. I thank Professor Acharya and uh, Dr. Puri uh, for giving me this opportunity to present on this wonderful platform. I bring greetings from Sir Gangaram Hospital and I shall be speaking on troubleshooting in esophageal manometry. So uh, I'll be speaking on troubleshooting in esophageal uh, manometry. Well, troubleshooting is very essential in uh, many aspects of life. It was actually troubleshooting which landed India on the moon after the failure of Chandrayaan-2. Uh, effective troubleshooting was what actually helped us land on the moon. Now, manometry machines are extremely complex machines where a lot of components are actually involved uh, in making the entire process work. These include a lot of catheters, a lot of capillaries, and uh, a lot of metrics which have to be evaluated. And you need to understand the actual troubleshooting which is involved when you are doing a manometry process. So to understand how to troubleshoot, it is also very important to understand the actual principles on which a manometry system works. So what basically we do in manometry is that there are several channels uh, in the catheter which is inserted in the area of interest. And these channels actually record the peristaltic pressures occurring at various points. Like in this case, this is an esophageal manometry catheter which has been inserted in the esophageal lumen. And it would be recording the esophageal peristaltic pressure waves going across. So the actual peristalsis which is occurring is occurring in a three-dimensional mode. Uh, but what you see on the screen is not in three dimensions but in two dimensions. And so what we actually see are colors. So these colors represent warm colors like pinks, uh, maroons or blacks which actu actually represent high pressure zones and you see cool colors which are blues, greens and yellows which represent the cooler colors. So in the areas where you are having high pressure zones, you are seeing the high pressures going down. So this is an esophageal peristalsis which, gra which is gradually going down with time and the lower pressures are the areas where the or the cooler colors are the areas where you have lower pressure so this is the pressure this is the area where there is relaxation of the sphincter and this is how this is what we actually see in a manometric graph now in a water perfused manometric system can you please play the video yeah so what actually happens in a, a water perfused system is that every system will be having a chamber which contains water and this water is propelled under certain pressure. This is usually one atmosphere. And this goes through an intricate set of capillaries. And these capillaries are eventually connected to a single catheter through which this water is dripping at a specific rate. And whatever pressure is offered to the flow of water in the area of interest, those pressures are converted into colors. And those graphs are, that, are then evaluated in the manometry graph. Next slide, please. So troubleshooting during manometry could be essentially at three steps. One, the most important is before the procedure, where we are actually setting up the instrument to see whether it is actually working right. Second is during the procedure, that is during the recording of the graphs. And third is after the procedure when you are analyzing the manometry graph. So troubleshooting is important and it could be at multiple places where you are doing the manometry. Can you please play the video? So before you do the procedure, the most important thing is to check whether all the channels are working fine. So now you have put in the catheter in water and you are lifting this catheter. What you would ideally want to see is that the pressure rise is equal in all the channels but here you see there are different colors in different channels so that means this is not working right so what you actually do in such a case next slide please please play the video so what you do in such cases before you start off with the procedure is you flush all these channels you flush all the channels properly to make sure that all the channels are perfusing the water effortlessly and this flushing is done several times till you have equal pressures in all the catheters. Please play the next slide. So here you see, next slide. Here you see that when you are lifting the catheter, you can see the, the same colors in all the channels when you are lifting the catheter and again bringing it down. So this is a rightly set system before you can actually go on 
and do the procedures you should all ensure that this happens before you start off with the process next slide please the next most important step is to localize the lower esophageal sphincter in this graph you apparently feel that you are the your catheter has gone across the ileus but you see the upper esophageal sphincter is coming down and then again going up so you are putting in the catheter deep and again pulling it out the upper esophageal sphincter is moving but the ileus is remaining at the same spot so this is not the ileus this is probably an artifact which is arising because the catheter channel has been blocked next slide please so this is how an appropriate ileus should look like the distance between the upper esophageal sphincter and the lower esophageal sphincter will remain intact irrespective of movements of the catheter and there will be a variation in the ileus pressures when you inspire and expire so the darker blue areas are the inspiration inspiratory phase at those dark blue areas you can see the augmentation of the ileus the increase in the ileus pressures and the light blue areas is where the patient is expiring and there again you can see the ileus pressures going down so this is appropriate localization of the ileus next slide please Uh, an important challenge that usually we face is those patients with end stage achalasia where there is a grossly dilated esophagus and here you are just not able to negotiate across the lower esophageal sphincter so in these in these cases certain maneuvers like change of patient position make him left lateral or sitting give water so swallows use endoscope with foreign body forceps or you can use a guide wire assisted catheter can you please play the video you can use a guide wire assisted catheter there are certain companies which are producing machines which have catheters where a guide wire can be put inside the catheter this increases the stiffness and then you can intubate across the lower esophageal sphincter more effectively next slide please the next thing after you have done this during the procedure one important thing you have to see is whatever colors you are seeing are these colors right so the first slide on the left is showing extremely blue pressures when the patient is inspiring this does not usually happen you would have light blue colors in your machines so the calibrations are wrong calibration means the machine is calibrated against a set of pressures using a bp apparatus that that thing is available with all machines make sure that your calibration file is right if you are getting inappropriate pressures check the calibration file again repeat the procedure with the appropriate calibration the right side graph is showing the correct calibration you can see the difference in the pressures in the left side you apparently are feeling there is an egg outflow obstruction which is not the case with the correctly calibrated file where there is no egg outflow obstruction next slide so another thing that can happen is sometimes during the procedure you can suddenly see that one of the one of the channels is showing an abnormal pressure like you can see you can see a dark blue line at the bottom that means this channel is not working right next slide next point so you have an option of closing that channel during the procedure time but make be very sure that this channel does not affect your lower esophageal sphincter so if done if this channel is right at the ileus there is no point in closing the channel or if the, if, if this channel is the last channel of your catheter you just cannot switch it off because that is your reference channel so if this is affecting other channels on your manometric catheter you can switch off that channel and then go ahead with the procedure next slide with solid state manometric catheters those though these are available at only very few centers there is something called as a, a temperature drift so in these cases there is an option to set your thermal compensation and make sure that this thermal compensation is on when you have a when you are using a solid state catheter next slide so sometimes next slide please so sometimes when you are doing the procedure you can see that there is a indentation on the left side or you can actually see the peristalsis going on the left so if you see something happening of that sort this is a wrong graph because peristalsis is always progressive it will never come back so if you see something an indentation on the left side where the peristalsis is moving forward that means these channels have been mal positioned the channels have not been set right the most common problem occurs is you are misplacing channel 6 with channel 9 on most of the systems you repeat the procedure with setting the channels in the correct correct procedure next slide sometimes you can get a bat wing kind of an appearance so here again you can see that the peristalsis is moving forward and again come back this never happens with peristalsis so here what the problem is happening is that the catheter has actually kinked into the esophagus and that is giving you a false bat wing kind of an appearance with the pressure graphs next slide one important aspect is diagnosing of egg outflow obstruction so the most common reason for diagnosing egg outflow obstruction is actually artifacts next slide 
so when you next slide please so when you get an egg outflow obstruction just make sure that it is actually egg outflow obstruction this can be co confirmed by changing the patient procedure position sometimes it is the cardiac indentation which causes an increase on the pressures on the lower esophageal sphincter you change the patient posture and this becomes normal next slide positioning of the contractile deceleration point this is again very very important you have placed the contractile deceleration point and you can see that the distal latency is less than 4.4.5 mind you a very low distal latency is extremely uncommon as an isolated disorder when you see a low uh, distal latency you make sure that you have placed the contractile deceleration point right so cdp is basically a point which has to be set on the isobaric contour it has to be set on the isobaric contour of 30 mm of mercury and it is almost always within 3 cm of the lower esophageal sphincter make sure you have pl placed your cdp right next slide please so once you have done the procedure what when you analyze the graphs one very important thing is to make sure that you are analyzing it yourself unfortunately most of the manometry systems these ais are not very good so in manometry systems your human intellect has to be always used just don't rely on what the machine is telling you make sure you are diagnosing the final diagnosis is itself so you always have an option of manually classifying whatever graphs you are seeing so don't rely on software generated diagnosis the final diagnosis always is manometry findings with the patient's history and also looking after the ancillary tests that are available to you next slide please so troubleshooting is an important aspect of all manometry procedures accuracy of manometry depends not just on performing the procedure but in performing interpreting and reporting it right thank you so much Uh, Shri Hari, I wanted to ask regarding the calibration after you have placed the catheter inside the esophagus and the patient is supine. So two things. We should calibrate after you place the catheter. Again, reset the pressures. Secondly, when would you like to do uh, the other types of manometry? The sup supine and the sitting. When do you go for rapid swallows? When do you go for uh, uh, rapid drinking test? So the first question, calibration. So calibration, if you are seeing the pressure graphs wrong, you come out, take out the catheter and again calibrate and then go in. So sometimes when you have the patient in sitting position, the newer versions of manometry systems that are now available, you can do it in real time. You can change the calibration file when you are actually doing the procedure and use a different calibration file. Now with different postures, the newer Chicago 4 that has come up that recommends that you should do all manometry procedures irrespective of the indication in both the primary, that is the supine position, as well as in secondary positions, that is also in sitting position. Uh, in general, we do, uh, we change the postures, especially in patients with EGG outflow obstruction, uh, where change of posture really helps you in actually making a diagnosis whether this is actually EGG outflow obstruction or it's not EGG. And most often it is not. Swallows, rapid, uh, rapid swallow test. So rapid, multiple rapid swallows is extreme, extremely useful when you have uh, an ineffective esophageal motility or absent contractility, and the patient is a patient of GERD, and you're planning for a surgery. So in those cases, if you have, M, you do an MRS, and you see an augmentation of the peristalsis, that means that there is a peristaltic reserve, and you can go in for a 360 degree fundoplication. On a multiple rapid solo, if the peristaltic reserve is absent, so there is no augmentation, then you should not do a 360 degree fundoplication. This is one for MRS. Rapid drink challenge is useful in differentiating between an EGG outflow obstruction and an achalasia cardiac. Shrihari, passage of uh, catheter through LES is a very, very common problem. Yeah. In many patients, especially in advanced uh, achalasia or patients who had a fundoplication done previously. So uh, you said passing a guide wire, which is not available in most of the centers. We cannot pass a guide wire. We cannot use a biopsy forceps to push the catheter. What are the tricks you are recommending for uh, passage of uh, so catheter in such a case? Three or four points. One is you can change the patient posture, make him sitting or left lateral, ask him to take some swallows, 
and using an endoscope use a foreign body forceps holding the tip of the catheter make sure that you're not holding the channels use the tip put it across the LES wriggle your endoscope and come out so I agree despite doing all this maybe in 10% of the cases you're still not able to go beyond so in those cases your other ancillary tests doing a proper endoscopy doing a retroflexed view uh, might help you in arriving at a diagnosis using a straw and Asking yeah, the so asking the patient to swallow some swallow sips of sometimes water sometimes helps. Yeah, yes, yes. Through his straw yes, yes. might help. If there are no more questions, uh, thank you, Dr. Shri Thank you. Thanks.